let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Romans, Romans chapter number 1, if that's, uh, if you're not familiar with that, if you go past the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll come to Acts, and then right after that, you'll find Romans, Romans chapter number 1. I want to draw your attention to verses 14 through 17 of Romans chapter 1, verses 14 through 17, and share with you this morning the power to change the world, the power to change the world. Romans chapter 1, verses 14 through 17. The Apostle Paul's writing, and he writes these words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He said, I am a debtor, both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the opportunity to come to church this morning and to once again attempt to lift up the matchless name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us, your willingness to leave glory, to robe yourself in flesh, to live on this earth for 33 and a half years without one single sin, and then to go up Calvary's hill and to lay your life down on that cruel cross and to suffer and bleed and die of one Friday for six long hours, to be buried in a borrowed tomb and to rise from the dead early Sunday morning, walking out of that tomb alive forevermore. And we realize that what you did was for our sins and for our salvation, and that there is salvation in none other. There is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. And we pray, God, that you'd help us to come back to the gospel message that could change the world. And Lord, reestablish uh, the Christian's confidence and belief in the Word of God. And Lord, help us to grieve over the fact that we have been deceived by the devil and uh, we think that there may be other answers out in the world. Help us to be reminded this morning that the answer for the world is what you have done for us on that cruel cross. So, Lord, help us this morning to get across your message in a way that it would help everyone that's here. If there's those in this service that are unsaved, Lord, move upon their heart to come to Christ by the Holy Spirit uh, so that they would be saved this very day. And God, stir the heart of every believer. And God, draw them to a new commitment uh, to get the gospel message out to this lost and dying world. Help us, we pray, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray and ask these things. Amen. Amen. The Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Timothy, chapter number 3, verses 1 and following through verse number 5, but he warned about the last days. What would the end times look like? Uh, Brother Owen talks about the coming of Christ often. And uh, he uh, is attentive to what's going on in the world. And every time you see events on the TV, it almost is a, a, a big banner saying, Jesus is coming soon. <laughs> and I hope that you're ready for the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But Paul told us what the, the days would be like, the last days. He said this, This know also. This is 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 and 2. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Why why will it be perilous times? For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, and he continues with a long list there. And as you look at what's going on in the world, you can't help but think, how can we solve the problems of humanity? Do you ever feel that way? How can we meet the need of our world? Well, 
Someone advise us, uh, use appeasement. Just give people what they want. I'm afraid a lot of parents have gone to the appeasement mode, you know. Uh, little Johnny's pitching a fit. Give little Johnny what he wants, and he won't pitch a fit anymore. Well, that'll work for just a little while, but sooner or later you'll realize that's not a good strategy to raise a child. Neville Chamberlain, the British Prime Minister, thought appeasement would work with Adolf Hitler before World War II. He reached the Munich Agreement with him, not realizing that Adolf Hitler would not just be satisfied with a portion of Czechoslovakia, but Adolf Hitler wanted the world. He wasn't going to be satisfied with just a portion of the world. Adolf Hitler was the type of man that wanted the entire earth. And there's no way to appease that kind of evil that's in the world. Well, some say, well, appeasement won't work. What about war? Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 8 says, there's a time to love, a time to hate, a time of war, and a time of peace. And sometimes war is necessary. If people didn't rally together to defeat men like Adolf Hitler, our world would be in grave trouble today, right? I'm glad that the forces of freedom conquered the tyrants of that day back in World War II. But if war was always the answer, why has war not worked? As long as we can think, in the recorded history of man, there's been conflict and war. And you would think if war worked, wouldn't there be a period of time that it would finally get to a place that there was no more need for war? And we see that is never taking place in the earth. Men have an evil heart, a tendency to be selfish. If they have something, they're not satisfied with that that they have. They look over there and they see what you have, and because they're selfish, they want that too. And war is not the answer. Peacement is not the answer, and war is not the answer. How many of you ever did a, a Google map search where you looked at the earth, and then you focused down a little further? Have you ever pulled up your own home? <laughs> and you keep coming further and further down. There's Florida, and there's Jacksonville. There's where I live at. Well, when you look at what's going on in the world, you have to stop and kind of... Uh, click that button that says let's get a little bit closer because we see we know what's going on in the world but you know what a lot of homes are in a state of chaos and confusion right and even if you click, click down a little bit closer and focus even deeper you look at the individual human heart and you see in that heart there is turmoil and conflict and no peace and the reason that the world is in the condition that it's in is because of the individuals in that world and the condition that their heart is in. Would you agree with that? Paul said that these last days, perilous times will come. Why? Because men will love their own selves. That means they won't care about you, right? Right? They won't care about anybody else in the world but themselves. They won't care about their wife. They won't care about their husband. They won't care about their children. They won't care about their neighbor. Uh, they won't care about their neighbor nations. They'll just care only about themselves. And let me tell you something. That's a dangerous world to live in when everybody just cares for themselves. Not only would they just love themselves, but they will love money. <laughs> Don't you think one of our biggest problems in the world today is covetousness? The love of money, Paul said, is the root of all evil. When you come down to the individual person, if you try to solve his problems or her problems, most people say, well, if they're having a really difficult time, let's take them to a psychologist someone who studies the mind. And listen to me before I go any further. I want you to be careful that you hear what I say, okay? <laughs> 
Because I do understand that sometimes there are minds that are afflicted and they are sick. But we can't just excuse everything. I'll give you a, a, a good example, schizophrenia. Uh, there's no way to solve that without medication. If that individual that's afflicted with that mental disorder, if he or she doesn't get their medication, uh, their life is just a, 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 it's a terrible thing to watch. I mean, they get at a point where they can't even exist. And so I understand that sometimes there's a need for that. It, just like a man might need help with his heart that's afflicted or someone with sugar diabetes needs help and medication or someone with a broken bone uh, needs that to be reset. By the way, young people, let me just insert here one word of warning as we look at a, a world that's embracing drugs and marijuana and everybody's telling you, hey, that's no big deal, ask Vicki, my oldest daughter is a nurse that looks into this often, and one of the things that leads to having schizophrenia is the use of drugs like marijuana. So if you want to keep your mind and be sane, it might be wise to stay away from those things, Amen. <laughs> But let me tell you something. Psychiatrists really don't have the answer for man's sinful problem. Man's sin problem. And that's really the problem that most people are honestly dealing with. It's not schizophrenia that we, all of a sudden it's a just crowded humanity. It's that we have evil hearts, selfish hearts. We have hearts that are not interested in doing what God wants us to do. I got in a discussion with a man once who just hates guns, hates guns. And I don't know how you are on the gun laws, but he wanted to take every gun in the world and just throw it in the ocean. And I said, that wouldn't do any good. Because they would pick up a knife or a rock or a stick. I think my son Cody said in Great Britain they did that, and there are more stabbings now in Great Britain than there were ever shooting. It's not the gun that causes the crime. It's the evil intent of the heart. You've got to deal with the heart issue. If you dealt with a heart issue, everybody could have a gun. If you dealt with a heart issue, and that man was a lost man. And I said, listen, guns are not really the problem. You're the problem. He said, what? <laughs> I said, listen, you know that you ought to be saved. You know that you should give your life to Christ, and you're refusing to do that. And you have children, and you're not encouraging those children to do that. And really this rebellion and hatred and evil that's in the world is because men refuse to get in a right relationship with God. I said, if everybody in the world was a Christian, you would never have to worry about locking your doors at night, would you? He said, you know everybody's not going to be a Christian. I said, but what if everybody was? There would be no murder. If everybody were genuinely born-again Christians, there'd be no murder, no rape, right? No burglary, no theft. The point is, the answer for the world is not psychology, it is Christ. It is to have a heart that's changed from self-love to Savior love. Remember a lawyer came to Jesus and he said, Jesus, tell me, if you were to sum up the Bible, what is the greatest commandment in the Bible? And our Lord said, that's a really good question. And I can sum it up for you. The greatest commandment in the Bible is to love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. That is the greatest commandment in the Bible. And without even asking, he said, let me tell you what the second is like. The second one is close to the first. Love your neighbor as yourself. He didn't ask for the second commandment. <laughs> he said, what's the greatest? But Jesus, listen, I want to inform you, loving God includes loving your fellow man. And you can't really say you love God and hate your brother or your fellow man. 
The answer for the world's problems is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ because it gets to the heart issue that changes us from self-love to Savior love, which includes neighbor love. So what this gospel, this world means is more and more of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice the confidence of the gospel. Paul said, let me tell you one thing, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And I remind us all this morning that Satan does his best to persuade us that what we believe is silly and sophomoric and ridiculous and how dumb do you have to be to believe the Bible? That's Satan's message in our day, isn't it? And really Satan is good at trying to convince us that what we believe the world just laughs at. They don't just chuckle at it. It's a belly laugh. I mean, they bend over double laughing at us because we believe in the Bible. That should not surprise us. Because men who are God deniers and God haters and uh, selfish are also in that list Paul gives blasphemers. So they mock the Bible to try to get you to believe that what you believe is really a silly thing. But Paul said, no, I am not ashamed of this gospel. For it is the power of God unto salvation. It's the only answer that meets the need of the world that we live in. And that's the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, let me remind you how they treated the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter number 4. Paul talks about the world's attitude and spirit toward him. And it's not just in this passage. Go back and begin to read your Bible again and you'll see where they laughed at Jesus. The Bible said they laughed him to scorn. They ridiculed the Savior. There's no telling what they called Jesus, the virgin-born Son of God, right? But listen to Paul's word in 1 Corinthians chapter number 4, verse number 9. For I think that God has set forth us the apostles last, as it were appointed to death, for we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. So when people look at us, uh, we are kind of the laughing stock. People, they cannot understand Christians or Christianity. He doesn't stop there. He said, we are fools for Christ's sake. But ye are wise in Christ, we are weak, but ye are strong, ye are honorable, but, but we are despised. Even unto this present hour, we both hunger and thirst, and are naked and are buffeted, that is, beaten with a fist, and have no certain dwelling place. And labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. We don't retaliate. When someone uses profanity against us, Paul said, what we do is we say, may the Lord bless you. That's our response to profanity. Wouldn't it be an amazing world if we lived in that kind of world? Someone was, they cut you off in traffic and you said, Lord, bless that person, keep them safe, make sure they don't do any harm to themselves or anyone else today. Out of real genuine love and concern for that person. You know, praying for their harm is not really a good prayer. <laughs> praying they have a flat tire, I don't know if the Lord would answer that kind of prayer. But genuine concern for them, the Lord will hear that prayer. That should be the response. What kind of world would we live in if that was the response to evil men? It would be a God-honoring world wouldn't it? He said when we're reviled, we don't per, uh, curse back. We don't use profanity. We bless. When we're persecuted, we just bear that persecution. We don't believe in retaliation. <laughs> Be 
honest now, do you have sometimes, do you find in your own heart an Old Testament kind of heart? Do you find in your own heart an Old Testament kind of heart? I think if we're all honest, we sometimes have to say, yes, I do find in myself sometimes an Old Testament heart. When I see people doing wrong, there's something in me that says an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, limb for limb. Especially if it's someone that we know well and it's dear to us, right? Amen. But what did the Lord say? He said, if you're slapped on your right cheek, you turn the other also. What kind of world would it be if men responded that way in this world? Without arrogancy, without pride, and without blasphemy, as the Apostle Paul warned about the last days. That's what the last days would look like, remember? Self-love, a love for money, a proud, arrogant, defending attitude. Only, only Christ can change that kind of heart to a humble, submissive, persecuting, I'll suffer the persecution type of heart. Wow, what this world would look like if it was a Christian world. Paul wasn't the only one that was familiar with persecution. The writer of Hebrews talked about how that the Christians in that day had their homes taken, their possessions were also taken, they were cast out of the city with nothing but their clothes on their back. Peter knew what suffering was like. He said this in 2 Peter 3.3, 3, knowing, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust. Speaking of the return of Jesus Christ. Satan knows if he can ridicule, mock, defame, then we will go silent with the gospel and evil will prevail. That's why Paul said, I am not ashamed to stand up and declare to you the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 17, Mars Hill, remember, the intelligent people of that day gathered around Mars Hill to either hear something they'd never heard before, be taught some truth they'd never crossed before. And Paul said, let me tell you something you've never heard before. You see, all of these idols you have here, there's one over here to the unknown God, and that's the one I want to tell you about, the one you have no clue of. Now, he probably didn't use the word no clue of. <laughs> and he preached to them Christ, his death, his burial. And when he got to the resurrection, he came to life again. They mocked him and ridiculed. Some laughed and walked away. But the Bible records in Acts 17 that some believed and they clave to the Apostle Paul. The gospel is not a guarantee that the entire world will be transformed and come to a saving knowledge of Christ, but the gospel is the best answer to the world's problems that we have. And if this gospel is going to impact our world, you and I have to have a great confidence in that gospel. We can't be silent the world is going to mock. That's the devil's tool. But we can't let their mockery keep us silent because the gospel is the only answer to this world's problem and to the eternal destiny of people that you're talking to about their soul. Amen? It's not just about the here and now. It's about what's coming after the here and the now. Notice the, also the call of the gospel in this passage. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. What does the gospel mean? Well, the word gospel means good news. It's amazing that the gospel is so hated in the world, isn't it? It's not bad news. <laughs> it's not divisive news. It's not intolerant news. It is great news. You and I are lost in our sins and we're on our way to hell, but there's a Savior who came to save us from our sins. That's great news, isn't it? Remember at His birth, the angels announced peace on earth, goodwill toward men. That's the heart of the Creator toward His creation. It is good intentions. It's intentions of love. It's intentions of salvation. It's it's the hope of eternal life. It's a 
right relationship with Him. It's a love that you and I cannot. It just, it's uncomprehendable how much that God loves us. This gospel requires two important truths. Two important truths. Two things. Repentance and faith. And without repentance and faith, you've never really come to a life-transforming gospel. There must be repentance and faith. Repentance alone cannot save you from your sins, and faith alone cannot save you from your sins. True Bible salvation includes repentance and faith. Our Lord began His preaching ministry in Mark chapter 1. This was the first sermon our Lord ever preached, recorded. Mark 1, verse 15. This is Jesus. And saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. You say, I want to know what the Bible says about salvation and the gospel. Well, it would be great to look at what Jesus, the Savior, said about the gospel. And the very first sermon the Savior preached was, Repent and believe the gospel. And if you would do a, a study through your Bible, you would find that word repent over and over again. Jesus would announce it again in Luke chapter 13. They came to Jesus with two examples of just terrible evil that took place in the world and Jesus used those examples to say let me turn the light back on your own heart and you need to understand this these people died yes but if you don't repent you will also perish Luke 13 verse 3 I tell you nay but except you repent you shall all likewise perish and then he said it again Luke 13 5 I tell you, nay, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. There is no salvation without repentance. The Apostle Paul is a great example of preaching the gospel. This is the gospel that he is not embarrassed of. He is not ashamed of. By the way, there are some gospels being preached in our day that we should be ashamed of that are not gospel at all. They're like Paul warned in Galatians 1. Whoever preaches that should be accursed. That's not a gospel because it's not a Bible gospel. Listen to what Paul said in Acts 17.30. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now God commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Paul again in Acts 20, 21 testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks. If you were to hear the Apostle Paul preach, wouldn't it be amazing to hear Paul preach? How many like to hear the Apostle Paul preach a sermon? I mean, after all, he wrote, some people think, 12 or 13 books in the New Testament, right? I mean, that would be amazing. You say, I wonder what he said when he was preaching the gospel that he was not ashamed of. Well, Acts 20 and 21 records his preaching on the gospel it says testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ you say preacher what does repentance look like well Paul repented remember before he was converted before he was saved before he was born again who was Paul he was Saul of Tarsus right and what kind of life did he live? He lived a life that was against Christ, opposed to Christ. Everywhere Christ was preached, he was there fighting against it. He had purposed in his heart to wipe out this Christianity off the face of the earth. Going to Damascus to put more Christians in prison, he met Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus saw a bright shining light he heard the voice of Jesus and he saw the image of Christ and he fell on his face and he said Lord who art thou he said I'm Jesus the Christ whom you're persecuting and he said Lord what wilt thou have me to do 
You say, preacher, what's repentance? Repentance is saying, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Lord, what do you want to do with my life? You see, too many of us who claim that we know Christ, we still are in charge. We still are making the determinations and decision where we're going to go, how we're going to live, what we're going to do. Have you really given your life to Christ? Before his conversion, he fought against Christ. After his conversion, he was fighting for Christ. That's what repentance looks like. Amen? Zacchaeus also repented, remember? In Luke chapter number 19, I sometimes want to call Zacchaeus Nicodemus. I don't know why, but Zacchaeus. Nowhere near the same, are they? <laughs> One of those things, I guess. I don't know. Before he was saved, he was a thief. He collected taxes, remember? And he would go and say, hey, you owe taxes, and they may owe $40, let's say. And he would say, well, you really owe 80 and he would give the Roman government the 40 that they were owed, and he would put the other 40 in his pocket. No one would know the difference, right? God knew the difference, and he knew he was a thief. Remember, he climbed the sycamore tree because Jesus was passing by. How many kids remember singing about that? And Jesus saw him up in the tree and said, Come down. Salvation has come to your house today, Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus repented of his sins because he got his heart right with God and he said, I'm going to go back to people I have stolen from and I'm going to return that that I've stolen. That's what repentance looks like, amen? Because you can't be right with God and wrong with your fellow man. Not Bible repentance. Peter repented. You say, where did he change from such a sinful lifestyle? Well, before he was a follower of Christ, he was a fisher of men. But when he came to Christ, Christ changed his occupation. Right? He said, now you're going to fish for me. You're no longer fishing for yourself. You're going to fish for me. And that really boils down to all of us what biblical repentance is. It is no longer living for me, but it's now living for Christ. It's not just coming to an altar and getting a ticket to heaven. It's coming to an altar and now letting Christ have control of your life. And if you're not willing to give your life to Christ, your heart to Christ, then you're not willing to accept His terms of salvation. Someone talks to you about your relationship with God Often they want to know, what is your relationship with Christ like now? And sometimes that's a little vague for us, right? After being saved, what's your relationship with Christ? Another question you need to strongly consider is, what is your relationship with sin now? Because repentance says, I'm no longer going to live for my pleasures and for myself and self-love and money, and things, and pride, and blasphemy, and disobedience. No, my heart's going to be changed, and it's going to love others, and love God, and love my mother, and father, and help, and be humble. That's what genuine salvation looks like. Isn't that true? That's true, say amen. amen. So first, what? Repentance? Can you say that? Repentance? And then secondly, what? Faith. You see, in James 2 says there is a faith that's a fake faith. You hear a lot about fake news lately? <laughs> there, James said, let me tell you about not just fake news, but a fake faith. There's a faith that says, yeah, I believe in God. I believe in the Bible. I believe in Jesus. And James said, that's all well and good. But Satan does that. Demons do that. The devils do that. And guess what? How much the devils believe in it? They believe in it so much their knees knock together. They tremble. <laughs> and we say we believe in it and there's no trembling at all. I think the devil's faith is even greater than that kind of faith because there's no trembling, no 
There is a holy God. I have sinned against Him. I really do deserve God's wrath and punishment, but Jesus went to the cross and He bore that wrath and bore that punishment. It's an amazing story of love. Faith is trusting only Him for my salvation. Depending only on His work on the cross to satisfy God's wrath for my sins. So there's a lot of people, they start going to church and they think, well, I'm going to read my Bible now and go to church and I'm going to be a Christian. You can't be a Christian just by reading your Bible and going to church. The only way to become born again, to be a Christian, is by repenting of your sin and putting your faith and trust in Christ. That's the call of the gospel. It's a call away from selfishness. It's a call away from hatred. It's a call away from evil. It's a call away from disobedience. It's a call away from unholy anger. It's a call to faith, obedience, humility. In the Beatitudes, Jesus said it simply this way, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall see God. Amen? And that cannot be the condition of our heart without genuine transformation on the inside. A heart transplant. And God takes the evil desires away. And by grace He puts in a new heart with new desires. Desires now to please God, to love God and to live for God. Has your heart ever been changed? I was around 16 years old when I was saved. 16. I wasn't raised in a Christian home. My mom and were uh, good to us kids. They had troubles. They took us to church just a few times when I was little. So I didn't know anything about the gospel, anything like that. And I started going to a church in our community. Uh... And they preached the gospel. And before I started going to that church, people would come to me and talk to me about Jesus. And I was like, oh man, come on. You know Jesus. You know those Jesus freak people, you know? Man, I'm trying to have fun. I don't want to hear about the Bible and Jesus and stuff. But in my heart, and so I started going to church and I understood what the gospel was and I was saved. And now I love being around people that talk about Jesus. I'm a Jesus freak. <laughs> Before I wasn't interested in the Bible, but after conversion, I can't get enough of the Bible. I want to learn more and more and more. Before salvation, I didn't really care about others. After salvation, I do. I genuinely care about others. See, God's able to change the world, but it's only the gospel that can change the world. Amen? When people come into right relationship with the Creator, that's what this world needs. And if you're saved and you're not telling this world the gospel, you're not a part of the solution. You're part of the problem. And really what you ought to do this morning is come to an altar and say, God, forgive me. You said if I was ashamed of you, you'd be ashamed of me. I'm not, saying, I'm not talking to anybody about being saved. What's wrong with me? Forgive me. Help me not to be ashamed of this glorious gospel. It keeps people out of hell. It brings them back into a right relationship with you. There's nothing better than the gospel. Amen? And if you're unsaved, what you ought to do this morning is come to this altar. You can kneel right where you're at, sit down, bow your head, and say, Jesus, I'm lost. I'm on my way to hell, and you're the only one that can save me. And I give my life to you. And I believe, I faith, that what you did on the cross is sufficient for my salvation. That's all I need is what you've done. After I was saved, I wondered, was I really a Christian? But sometimes I'd mess up at the house and mom and dad, they weren't saved, and they'd say, you, if you, you're not a Christian. Christians don't act like that. <laughs> so one night at, uh, after church, I walked home. 
And I was just saying, God, if I'm not saved, would you please save me? If I'm not saved, would you please save me? It's kind of like saying, one of my children come to me saying, if I'm not, if you're not my daddy, would you please be my daddy? If you're not, I'd say, be quiet. Now that's enough. I'm your daddy. Be quiet. And after a while, I knelt in the dirt road and I said, Lord, if I'm not saved, would you please save me? He, I heard his voice. It wasn't an audible voice, but it was just as clear if it was an audible voice. And he said, Romans 10:13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, I hadn't memorized that verse. And he asked me, he said, Did you call? I said, Yes. He said, Then you let me worry about the saving. You did your part. Now trust me that I'll do my part. If, you're, if you've never been saved, let me tell you something. Turn away from your life, your sins. Come to Christ and trust Him. He will save you. He always does His part. Amen? You can trust Him. Trust Him this morning. Let's stand for prayer. Father, we thank You for the power of the Gospel. It's really the only agent of change. And while Satan's done a good job to convince many Christians in America to go silent, our hearts are stirred to realize that all over the world there are still men and women that are laying down their lives for the sake of the gospel. Some have been in prison for a long time just because they're a Christian. And just because they would not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. God, I pray you stir our hearts that we might recommit to you this morning to be vocal about this great news, this good news that men need to hear, that Jesus Christ can save them from their sins. And help us to know what the gospel is. It's a call of God to repent and place our faith in Christ only. And I pray, God, there's someone here this morning that they think that they've been a Christian, but they look at their life and they see there's been no change. There's been no turning. I'm still living for me, still doing basically what I want. I'm not interested in God's will, God's heart, what Christ wants. I'm not interested in spending any time with Christ. We're helping to see that's a fake gospel. Repentance means coming and giving one's life to Christ. Now, Lord, if there's someone here that's trying to trust in their goodness or their works, help them to realize that none of that will ever save them. The only one who can save them is Jesus Christ. And help them put their faith and trust in Christ this morning. Have you in this invitation, Father, be glorified, lift up the wonderful name of Jesus, for it's in his name we pray and ask these things. Amen. Brenda, what page?